Habits and Health, episode 82. Welcome to the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to another edition of Habits and Health. My guest today, Dr. Lloyd Globerman. He's a renowned clinical psychologist and inventor who, after years of working with audio technology to help people accomplish meaningful changes in their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, he recently coined the term lifestyle intelligence, LQ, and created a widely available app that guides users along a clear pathway towards balanced health in a daily three minute segments. And we're gonna find out a lot more about what is lifestyle intelligence, how it came about. Uh, so that's today's episode with Dr. Lloyd Globerman. Hope you enjoy it and please do share it with anyone who would get some real value from it. Habits and health, my guest today is Dr. Lloyd Globerman. How are you, Lloyd? Pretty good, thank you. Happy to be here. If someone asked you the question, who are you? How would you answer that? I'm somebody who is always continually trying to understand myself a little bit better than before. Given the state of consciousness that I currently occupy compared to the state of consciousness that I was in decades ago and even going back to adolescence and into young adulthood, I understand the issue of we are all personally evolving creatures and I'm curious to know what is next. So I always pay attention to what's going on inside my head, especially on levels that aren't accessible. Because one thing I learned to appreciate over time is how we all have this creative unconscious, mm -hmm. which is by definition not available to us. But every so often we're aware of it when something pops into our heads that wasn't there before that is useful. I'm always interested in what the next thing is going to be. And every one of us shares that. So I, that's pretty much the way I occupy my space in the world right now. Can you remember what made you first get interested in that area? Well, the, the irony is those things occur all the time. But the issue with things that occur all the time is that they tend to be invisible by virtue of their omnipresence. Mm. So it was only when I started learning about these issues and realizing, hey, wait a minute, that's what that is. When I could put a label on it so I could then appreciate it as it was happening, that it became more meaningful for me. Mm. It continues to be. I'm always surprised at our brains. I think it's the one thing that we don't, all of us, we don't appreciate how incredible our brains are, which is basically the universe having recreated itself. Right. And it all started with that single cell. And here we are, 34 and a half trillion cells later. I think none of us appreciates the complexity of what we are, who we are. In that discovery that you've made on yourself over the last few decades, it sounds like, is there anything that stands out that you really learned about yourself? I had ideas along the way that I was always under the assumption that if something was in my head, it was also in everybody else's head. Mm. Just like when you have a family and you go out into other people's homes, you naturally assume that what you're going to be seeing is a variation of what your family is. The same thing, right? You expect everything to be the same because it's a family, mom, dad, kids. But then after a while, you begin to realize that's not the case. And every after a while, I began to realize, hey, maybe I actually have something interesting because most of the time I perceived myself as just an average kid who could do. I remember being in elementary school and they had a class when I changed schools where they put certain kids into a class that was a little bit different, a little bit more advanced. And when I was told to go into that class, my first response was they must have made a mistake. So one of the joys of my life is realizing that all the thought, things I thought about myself early on actually weren't true and I had more to offer. And hence, my life became more interesting and my confidence went up because it had a long way to go before it, it occupied a central space in, in my behavior, if you know what I mean. And how were you able to tie all of this into what you actually do and how you help people? I began to understand that I was pretty good with understanding people's emotional states. I could look at people's faces and understand what emotions they were experiencing. Obviously took a lot of training in terms of psychotherapeutic techniques and began to think, okay, I can do this pretty well. 
But what's most interesting is that I began to have ideas that were a little bit outside the boundaries of most of the things that were happening. And so it gave me an opportunity to explore and actually found out that I could offer something that was a little bit different and actually could be useful, which evolved out of my professional life, but was still part of it. It wasn't part of therapy practice, but it was a product that turned out to be useful. And that was an eye opener for me because the idea that I could do something like that early on was out of the question. But here, oh, okay, this is good. I'm surprising myself, which is a treat for life. It's nice to surprise yourself from time to time. And that ended up being the audio products that I began developing in the 1980s. So the issues, or maybe the main issues that your clients are facing now, have they changed much in the last couple of decades? That's an interesting question because right now, given the COVID epidemic and the impact that it's had, I think that altered things and that magnified things. So anybody who was prone to having anxiety or depression, that was going to be multiplied exponentially by the structure of what was happening. And I think what it taught all of us is that we all lived in a a space-time continuum, a social space-time continuum. But we were unaware of it because it was the only reality we ever knew until that reality because of the virus was disrupted. Mm. And when that was disrupted, when suddenly you were in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people because of the disruption of time and space, that made everything else that you were having problems with that much more problematic. So in one respect, now is the time to think about how things have changed. Other than that, most people have problems with relationships and anxiety and being depressed and all the typical kinds of things. That hasn't changed. But the context now is very different. It's more difficult. And so when you talk about anxiety, is has before COVID, so let's go back to 2019. you think anxiety has got worse recently or not much difference? No, it's, well, you mean putting COVID aside? Yeah. I think it is probably increased a bit. I think some of it has to do with context. Like we all have our familial context and our work context, but the world in which we live in this country right now is different. There's been... A, a tremendous amount of change in things that have happened, in the amount of anger that's out there, the amount of confusion as a consequence of that, the issues that are now out there that hadn't been there before in terms of will this country survive what it was meant to be? I think that context has expanded to the point where it's affecting everybody on an individual level. In addition to all the anxiety caused by COVID in addition to people's general interpersonal lives. So everything is a little bit different now and a little bit more difficult. And how are you able to help people with that? I think the most important thing is provide as much feedback as you can so that everybody can understand all of these multiple contexts that things are happening in. So that if there's anxiety in one part of your life that wasn't there before, label it, and then notice how it can migrate to other places. But the fact that you are now aware of it gives you an opportunity to intervene in your own mind. So the more you can provide people with better maps of what's going on, whether personal, professional, cultural, the more opportunities they have to be able to contain and manage as best they can. But if you're a wife and you're, and either you or your husband has suddenly lost their job because of these circumstances, that's a whole lot of anxiety to deal with because you've got that disruption and all the financial anxiety that comes with it. So there are a lot of moving parts in all of this, in all of our lives right now. Mm. So you do your best you can. And sometimes people obviously need medication. Sometimes you teach them relaxation skills or offer them material that they can use to, to help mitigate some of this. But you can only do so much. Everything has limits, if you know what I mean. And I think you do. This is a bit of a, the answer to this is generalizing here. Is there a method or a technique that is helpful to most people? There are a variety of different things that you can do. And if you want people to uh, maybe fully understand what's happening in a particular set of circumstances, 
then there are visualization exercises that you can use. So you get somebody into a relaxed state and then you have them look at a screen from a distance so they can see themselves in a particular set of circumstances so they don't have to feel the feelings of the circumstances, but they can just watch the transactions on a screen in front of them. And then you come back, put that aside, and then you come back and think about, okay, what kind of skills would you need to deal with this kind of set of circumstances? So we will discuss situations in their life when they were able to do certain kinds of things. So it's let's borrow from that. So close your eyes, remember what that was like, and you go through a whole set of circumstances in, internally, then you bring that skill set to this set of circumstances, have them watch what's going on the screen with them now having access to what they knew they had but weren't in touch with it. And then the last part would be float into the screen and feel as if it were happening in real time so you can handle it better. So there are ways to help people deal with stuff. Uh, and would the... Are most of your clients from New York? Are I imagine in big cities, I come from London myself, mm -hmm. in big cities, people are going to generally, maybe I'm wrong, generally have much more anxiety and stress than outside of a big city. Typically only because of the intensity of everything. But it doesn't mean that there's not folks who live in the suburbs. And I don't know, I've been, I grew up in the suburbs. I think just living there in and of itself right now would be create a lot of anxiety for me because there wouldn't be enough stimulation. So I'd have to figure out what to do. So each environment has its own, but big cities, obviously, there's a lot more going on and a lot more to be, a lot of more information you need to keep track of. But I don't know, I'm relaxed in the city. I'm more relaxed here than in other places. And you would think just the opposite, but that. Nah. Are most of your clients from New York? Yes, yes, yes. Either, either New York or close by. Some people are from Jersey, some people are from Connecticut, Long Island, but the bulk of people are, certainly when I was seeing most of the people in my office, it would be obviously much easier if you lived a few blocks away or a subway right away or a bus. Do you see most people face to face then? Not right now, obviously up, up until COVID, but most people tend to like the uh, doing it remotely because it makes their life easier on a certain level. You don't have to put aside that extra time. You don't have to go through the whole transportation issue. So less money, less time. And more, for most people, it works. But it, it is nice to have the presence of a person for a little bit of time, just so we can know each other that way. So I try to suggest that to people, that immediacy, being in somebody's presence, I think adds to what can be done, but sometimes that's not available to some people. Do you, as, I get the impression that in the States, mm -hmm. there's a very different attitude to therapy than there is in the UK. And in the UK, there seems to be a bit of a stigma about it. But in mm -hmm. the States, it seems like it's much more normal. It's accepted. I'm certainly in New York, it's as routine as anything. I have a lawyer, I have an internist, I have a dentist, and my therapist. Nobody blinks. It's just that prolific here. Mm. Maybe that's a consequence of the fact that you have so many people and that may be that many more stressful kinds of things as you alluded to before, or everybody's just used to their therapist and what's going on. Most of the therapists in the city right now are pretty busy, as you can imagine. And you've coined a term called lifestyle intelligence, haven't you? What, what is that? I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and that was a time when in terms of the issues, the core components of lifestyle, eating, sleeping, and moving about, there was no information whatsoever about what was good, what was not good, what you should do, what you should not do. So nobody knew what nutrition was back then. It was simply, you had enough to eat. Nobody knew anything about exercise. Mm -hmm. It was something you did in the gym. And sleep, who thought sleep was that important? It was more of a nuisance that you had to do so you didn't get tired in the middle of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So during that entire period of time, nobody knew anything about what was really important. And slowly over time, what has happened is we have more and more people who are getting degenerative diseases. And we also have, by the year, I think 2030, the projection is that half the country is going to be obese, which means all the diseases that come with weight issues are going to be prolific, mm -hmm. which will do a variety of things, including exponentially increase what it's going to cost for health care. Mm 
Mm. So you would think that now, because of the fact that we have all of this information available, you can't go anywhere without hearing information about what you should eat, how you should exercise, how much you should sleep. Mm. Correct? For magazines, television shows, everything, every place you turn, mm. that information is there, but it's not being used. The question is, why, given what we now know, that everybody is not gravitating to this information, employing it so they can take really good care of themselves? That's not happening. So I decided to borrow a model that was originally used by two psychologists. They, they wrote an article for a social psychology journal. Their names were Peter Salavoy and John Mayer. Their article was entitled Emotional Intelligence EQ. And what they did was they took all of the components that made for a healthy emotional frame of mind, all the skill sets that were central to that concept and put it under the umbrella of emotional intelligence, EQ. So social skills, so emotional management, empathy, self-awareness, all of these things which were independent variables that people would encounter were now subsumed under something that was smart to be. Hmm. Absolutely brilliant idea. Hmm. So I borrowed that model from them and I've decided why not do the same thing with lifestyle intelligence, LQ. Why not have people understand that the issues of what you eat, how much or if you exercise and your sleeping are all tied together. Hmm. They are an ecosystem for what you need to understand in order to be as healthy and in control of your life as you can be. So Lifestyle Intelligence LQ was born. Now, how do I deliver this? How do I put it in a context? Because with so much out there, how is this gonna differentiate itself? Yeah. So the one thing I know about psychology is if you provide regular reinforcement, if you provide continuous information, repetition, reinforcement, that eventually takes root in people's minds. Hmm. So the app that I have, obviously called Lifestyle Intelligence LQ, focuses on providing five days a week, three minute segments. And within each segment, I talk to you about sensation, information, and motivation as it's reflective of sleep, eating, and exercise slash movement. Because innocuous movement is really important in addition to exercise. I wanted to toss that in because that's a really incredibly useful piece of information. So the whole idea is, I don't say the same thing over and over again, but I provide variations on these themes so that eventually you take the baton from me and begin to play some of this in your head to help you make these changes and take charge and control of your life in the best way possible. Nothing is perfect. And what's built into lifestyle intelligence is the fact that there is always going to be times when you fall off the wagon a little bit. That's built into this. That's normal. Because New Year's resolutions is not the way to go. And everybody knows how useful they've been, and for the most part, useless. Mm. So the whole idea is understand, and it's all subsumed under a statistical concept called regression to the mean. There's a tendency for people to fall back to their average. So lifestyle intelligence is helping you develop a new average at a higher level. You can't be perfect, perfect is impossible, but life is all about what you do most of the time. My job is to help you get to that point most of the time. That's the structure, that's the main component of lifestyle intelligence. But there's another component that's secondary, but really, <laughs> I'd like to put it on equal footing, but it's a product that I had before, but I put them together because it offers some additional ways to help you acquire 
the skills you'll need to implement everything that I've just talked about, which are long term. These three minute things, the other parts are recordings that are 25 minutes long, which help you relax and learn in a different kind of way. So, and so those three minute recordings uh -huh. you mentioned. So is so someone just looks at the app and they listen to these recordings. Are they given exercises to do as well? Well, the whole idea is every time they listen to those that three minute piece, the whole idea is you're going to use this information during the course of the week. You're going to perhaps notice the rhythms of your appetite this week. You're going to pay much closer attention to that moment in time while you're eating that you realize you're not hungry anymore because so many people blow past that <laughs> as if they were running through a stop sign. We have, we were born with those stop signs. When we were born, we knew three things. We knew when to eat and how much to eat. We knew when to sleep and how much to sleep. And we knew when to move and to call for somebody to pick us up. All of that sensory information was wired into us. Mm. So we all had that language that came with our brains and bodies. Sensory experience was our cognition. Our thoughts and our sensations were actually one, were synonymous at that moment in time. Mm. However, as we got older, we became part of a family structure which had its own rules and rhythms and patterns. I grew up in that. I remember. <laughs> I knew nothing of any of this. I was When it came to the, what I'm talking to you about right now, I know personally because I was blind, deaf, and dumb. So in terms of what to eat, how much to eat, and all the other aspects of it, I understand how the family can be very seductive in teaching you how not to pay attention to what's going on inside of you. Mm -hmm. So that sensation becomes something you ignore mm -hmm. because you're supposed to finish what you eat on your plate because kids are dying in Africa and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So that's the whole idea is to remind people of what's important. I'm not saying do this way now. This is your life. You're gonna notice it. I respect what you're doing. I'm having you think about it differently so that you can make the best choice possible wherever you are at any moment in time. And so by giving people that awareness of the mm -hmm. in that they've been subjected to, are they more likely then to maybe be able to challenge it? They would be much more likely to be able to deal with things because suddenly they're going to be aware of it. Because as I'm talking to you right now, I'm sure everybody listening is suddenly thinking about this mm. and perhaps thinking about their own upbringing and all the other things that go along with how we forget to pay attention to our sensory experience, which is, that's the core. Mm. Once you do that and sleep, by the way, the most important thing of the whole of everything is sleep, mm. which is something is hard for people to wrap their minds around. Mm. Sleep is, is unequivocally the most important thing we do because if we don't sleep enough, we get our appetite gets amped up unnecessarily. So now we're hungry. We're much more hungry. If we don't get enough sleep, our emotional life goes into disarray because when you're sleep deprived, you get cranky, you get angry, all of those kinds of things. And obviously it makes it less likely you're going to exercise because you have less energy. Yeah. So all of this <laughs> comes together in way. Oh, by the way, one thing, that was a, a catalyst that ensured that I was going to do this app. There's a bit of information that came out, I believe it was 2019. When I read this thing, I said, this has to go viral and everybody will be talking about it. It has to do with sleep. And it was discovered that when you sleep, when you're asleep, there's a certain moment in time when the spaces between your brain cells open up and cerebrospinal fluid pours into your brain. Mm. And then your brain goes into dishwasher mode mm. and begins to cleanse itself of all the toxins, all the waste products from the day because the brain burns a lot of energy, way more than any other organ in the body. Yeah. It wants to clean itself, okay? So 
The question that's begging to be asked is, what happens if you don't clean your brain? Mm. I'm sure everybody right now knows what I'm talking about. Heart disease is really scary, as is cancer. But anything having to do with the functioning of our brains and our sense of self is the most terrifying thing that we will ever think about, correct? Wouldn't you think that bit of information would just rip through and everybody would be aware of it? Nope, <laughs> never happened. That was part of, I said to myself, wow, if that doesn't take root, we need something that'll keep the momentum going, get people's attention, get them thinking about just how important their lives are. So that was one of the catalysts that set lifestyle intelligence LQ into motion. You talked about not just simply the importance of sleep, but how the vital, vital it is. Mm -hmm. But for, for many people, they they feel they've tried everything under the sun to improve their sleep, and they say they just can't improve it. I, I'm not suggesting that simply because I'm saying mm. that, that's going to do that. Mm. But So you have to ask yourself, what's happening in your life that you do have control over? Mm. Because if you're doing the kinds of things that a lot of people do at night, which is Nighttime's the time I don't have any responsibilities to anybody, and this is the self-party time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take out my computer or my phone, and I'm going to do all kinds of things on the web. So what happens? You're looking at a screen that's lit up. What's that going to do? If you are going to start feeling fatigue, that light's going to stimulate, oh, stay away, making it much more likely, mm -hmm. okay? Do you exercise enough to allow that exercise to impact? the normal evolution of fatigue at the end of the day, which is what you want, right? Are you doing everything you can? A lot of people are not. I'm not saying there are a lot of, there's not a lot of anxiety in people's lives, but the issue, the most important thing that we do about anything is whatever we can control, we must control. Hmm. So make sure that everything that you do is lining up. And then if there's still problems, now, I'm not going to tell people to take supplements, but there are useful supplements for sleep. Check it out. Make sure that you your physician gives it the okay, signs off. That's fine. But if you do enough, you just might find that you can begin to improve the quality a little bit. And once you do that, then the, your confidence is there. Mm -hmm. But yes, I agree with you. It's a hard thing to do when you're completely out of sync. But once you start taking those steps and improving something as important as sleep, it then mm -hmm. actually compounds and makes the other things easier, doesn't it? That's correct. That's what you're saying to me right now is the linchpin of the whole thing. That's why it's so important. Mm. I can't emphasize that enough for somebody who didn't know what they were doing <laughs> for God knows how long. By the way, one of the things, and this is going to sound a little bit oversimplistic, but if you need an alarm clock to wake up in the morning, you're sleep deprived. The only question is how much. Yeah. Yeah. There's some great studies. People who are taken out into the wilderness for a week or two mm -hmm. and just told to wake up whenever they wake up. There's no technology and they can go. No, don't set. worry, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they set themselves and then they find out what is their, their true wake up time. Oh, okay. that's a great thing. It's not available to most people, but yeah. that's brilliant. Mm. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, restart the whole thing, Yeah. right? Oh, yes, I think. You can figure out a way to do that. There's some variation on that theme, but I agree. Thank so you. when did this app come out? It's relatively new. We're talking about a few months now. It's in the Apple Store. And if you want to get a little bit more information, the website for it is called this is all small letters, everything together, lifestyle intelligence LQ, all one word, dot com. The screen will show up, it says, tell me more, and then it'll immediately go to a couple of minute video of me talking about what we've been talking about here and go a little bit further into it because it'll also talk about the audio material that's a secondary part of this that's really useful. And it'll allow you, this is a month's free trial. Right. so. People have an opportunity to see whether what I've been talking about could actually be meaningful in their life without having to spend any money. And what kind of feedback have you been getting from people who have been using it? People who've been using it have been enjoying it. Right. And so far, so good, but it's in early stages. But I think I have something useful and right. useful. I can't think of anything better word than useful. Useful is useful. We all like that word. 
Is it useful? Yeah, it's useful. I guess it's one of the hardest parts from your point of view. Mm-hmm. There's so much noise get, trying to get the information to people about the app in the first place. Especially in the world we live in. <laughs> in indeed. How do you get people's attention when you have something good? And the, the idea is, well, to talk to somebody like you who's giving me an opportunity to talk to people who, who know you and trust you. Then that's the best vehicle I can think about because people trust you to choose people that you trust. Okay, that's good. That's good for me and for anybody who has something that's useful. Is who would you say this would be most useful for? That's a really good question, and I don't think it has any particular age group that stands out above the rest because the issues are pretty much the same. So I don't think I think it can be useful for young adults. Middle-aged people, older people. I think anybody can find benefit from the product. How do you see this developing over the next few years? Do you have further plans to add other things to it, for example? At the moment, no. Obviously, I will add as time goes on additional pieces. Hmm. But right now, this is the way it is. If I can get it out there that certain things are happening that are really useful, then I might, at some point, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, if it, if I feel as if something. Really, be I, I need an additional piece. Hopefully, the thing I talked about with the whole creative unconscious thing that'll suddenly start working in the background. It'll pop up for me. That would be delightful. And right at the moment, this is what I have, and I think it's useful. And do you, in all the stuff that we've talked about, all the awareness you've learned about yourself and helping all these different mm-hmm. people, do you use like blog about any of this, or do you have any plans to maybe write a book, for example? Not at the moment, and I've never done any blogging. Basically, the only things that I've done were that was a series of audio products that are available but are now part of this, the lifestyle intelligence things. But no, me going out and speaking to folks like you is the first time I'm I am now promoting myself in any way. Is there a book you can think of that's moved you in any way? Yeah, it, it's a little bit outside the boundaries of what we've been talking about, but. Back when I was in college and very involved, this was late 60s, I was very involved in uh, altered states of consciousness and what was enlightenment about. And aside from experiences, there was a book, somebody said, you have to read a book called The Book by a philosopher theologian by the name of Alan Watts. And it was multiple levels for me because one, I had never seen anybody write so beautifully. It was like he was singing. It was so beautiful. And the whole idea of what enlightenment was Mm. in in terms of outside the boundaries of self and ego, absolutely brilliant. And he opened my eyes to the idea of everything's connected and all the kinds of things that you think about when you think about things that are spiritual and beyond the boundaries of everyday consciousness. But more, actually, maybe more important is that I learned from it. I thought that he wrote so beautiful that it was really easy for him to write. Mm -hmm. And then I saw him interviewed. And what he talked about was he'd spend an entire day writing and that if he was able to get just two pages that he liked, that was great. And I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, it takes hard work to do all these things. And I thought all these really talented guys could just knock it out. It helped me gain a little bit of confidence that, oh, now I get it. I didn't have the discipline to do that and didn't know that's what it was about, but now I do. Mm. So everything opened up in a different kind of way. What would you say to anyone who would look at a book by Alan Watts and think, oh, that's from the 60s, that's not relevant anymore? If you read it, you'll see it's relevant. <laughs> it's, it's because the issues are the issues. They haven't changed. If people want to find out more about you, where's the best place to look? Go to the website. If you Google my name, a whole bunch of stuff that I had written for the Huffington Post will pop up on a variety of different topics. The audio material that that I've recorded, lots of different places where it's available, but you don't have to worry about that if you're interested, because that's obviously it's part of the website. But there'll be a bunch of stuff that I've written. So you'll see different issues that I've found important and worthwhile. And if you're interested, you might find them worth reading. And is the app on both Apple and Google? No, just Apple. And finally, is there a quotation that you particularly like? I remember a long time ago, I took a psychotherapy workshop and and the leader said, psychotherapy is more about the technician than it is about the technique. And wow, that's really interesting. And over time, in terms of what I've read and, and, and interacted with people, it made a whole lot of sense to me. And it was, I realized that it was like, a musical instrument, 
So it's like the saxophone, the instrument, and it doesn't sound really very good. Some people play that horn and it sounds brilliant, mm. but it's the same horn. Yeah. Psychotherapy is kind of the same thing. There's so many different therapies out there and somebody does cognitive behavioral therapy, somebody does gestalt therapy, rational emotive therapy, all kinds of things are out there, but it's who's doing it. Mm. Who can make you feel comfortable? Who can create an environment of trust? Mm. Because once that's there, then you can guide people through any sort of exercise. But if that's not there, it's not quite the same. Yeah. That's so, that always was meaningful for me. Yeah, and that's, that's so true as well. It's, it's something great to think about. Well, yeah. Lloyd, I really appreciate your time and thank you for sharing this. Hopefully that will be really useful to so many people and can really help people. I greatly appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Next week is episode 83 with Dr. Brian Taylor, who is the Senior Director of Audiology at Signia, which is a division of WS Audiology. He's authored several peer-reviewed papers and textbooks and is a highly sought out lecturer with 30 years of experience as a clinician, business manager and university instructor. So we dig into many areas around hearing health and how that relates to general mental and physical wellness. So that's next week, Dr. Brian Taylor, episode 83. Hope you enjoyed this week's episode with Dr. Lloyd Glauberman. If you know anyone who gets some value from this, please do share the episode with them and hope you have a great week. Thanks for tuning into the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. You can also sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at TonyWinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health podcast.